Bonjour, uh, nous comptons Wesot. Welcome for joining us today. So we're going to have an exciting uh, panel. And as I said previously, for those who join us right on time, there's a lot of Zoom events uh, happening today. Uh, this morning, I attended two panels uh, by, organized by the CFC Negro Conference, and they were organized by Siam, Buame, and Denise Provence. It was very exciting. And here I am presenting with three fabulous scholars another event. Before we really start, I would like to thank my department, Department of Modern and Classical Literatures and Cultures, and uh, the Center for African and African American Studies for their support and their sponsorship. My two guests today, and I should say my two fabulous guests today, Dr. Alisa Sepinwald California, from California State University San Marcos and Dr. Valerie Liosho from Emory University are presenting very important research that will re-energize discussions, I hope, about how to tell history and a story, or rather how to go beyond pedestrians, uh, pedestrian narratives. They also tackle the issue of what kind of material we need to do so. At third glance, it seems that both of their books focus on different topics, but they both put the emphasis on arts, performing arts, creativity, and artistic treatments of the past and memory among Afro-descendant individuals. Discussions around how to talk about the past, particularly the history of slavery and the colonial past are more important now than ever before. The crucial idea here is to talk about the past, history and memory in a way that is not going to make everyone agree, but is going to create a more accurate record of whatever happened. In the wake of movements such as Black Lives Matter, we live in a time when some parents in the US attempt to protect the fragile minds and innocence of their children by attacking their school districts for the teaching of particularly poignant or problematic, namely, namely scary and shameful historical events. These parents would rather have certain historical facts wiped out from the curriculum for fear of traumatizing their kids. This desire to protect the innocence of the youth could be laudable, but what about parents who do not have that privilege? We also live in a time during which social media are inundated with photos of proud US border patrol agents on horseback using what looked like whips, nearly their reins, to make sure that Haitian migrants crossing Latin America and attempting eventually to find asylum in the US stay away from US border. While many find these pictures horrific, some believe the treatments of these Haitian migrants is justified. These migrants left Haiti in the wake of devastation wrought by a hurricane among many of the trials and tribulation only to be deported and or treated like subhuman beings. Without knowing the history of Haiti and Haitian migration, one may not understand why these migrants would go through all the hassle of crossing the sea to reach Latin America and then trying to reach the US. That is the purported urgent crisis narrative around Haiti which omits an accurate, always an accurate historical contextualization and discussions of the everlasting influence and meddling of urban countries and or the US is but an example of the power of narrative and the creations of a particular reality. So many things are happening at the same time now. So much loss, even for academia, I'm thinking about the death of Charles Mills, or more, even more recently, Marcel, uh, Marcel Dorini. So much so that we are left often too dizzy or too numb, too overwhelmed to know what to do. At least today, 
we can start talking about the narrative of the past, at least a particular narrative, to understand the narrative of the present. We can question how this madness started and how we arrived where we are now. Everything is about how you sell a particular narrative. The two scholars I invited today, we talk about how history is all around us and can be properly read if we know how to read it. I will first introduce Alisa Sepinwo. I will also add some information about her via links that I will drop in uh, the chat. And I will do the same uh, with uh, Dr. Bali Yoshu. So I met Dr. Alisa Sippenwall on Twitter. She's become what we can call a Twitter story and friend. I hope that I will have the opportunity to meet her face to face eventually. But until then, I wanted to invite her today to share her research with us. For people following Dr. Sippenwall on Twitter, you know that she's not only a great scholar, but she's also a great ally and accomplice who makes sure that issues around representations of Haiti, Haitian history, and so on, are well debated on Twitter and clear and accurate for the general public. She's all about shifting the usual biased narrative in a very accessible fashion. A latest book, Slave Revolt on Screen, The Asian Revolution in Film and Video Games starts by reminding us how, in literature, the Haitian Revolution has haunted European discourses since the early 19th century, how suggested by many scholars, such as Nick Nesbik, who I hope will be able to join us today. I'm using the term haunted to bring to our attention to a past that particular groups attempts to erase and repress, a process that Freud termed the unheimlich, the uncanny, and Omi Baba called to some extent the unhomely. Dr. Simperwall starts with a particular assertion. Despite all the literature about the Haitian Revolution, there are few films on this event. In probing the reason for this omission, she not only exposes and explores structural issues and resource inequities in the film industry, but also investigates how slavery and the memory of colonial past have been portrayed on screen, namely too often distorted and misrepresented. Using Chris Rock's independent movie, Top Five, about a black actor who makes a movie about the Haitian revolution and encounters resistance from white people around him as he tries to convince people to go and see his movie to open the discussion of the book, she sets the tone. The fact also that critics snubbed the topics within the movie that Chris Rocks created and ignore also this movie reinforces Dr. Sippenwald's point. She covers her ideas in 10 chapters divided in three parts. Part one, foreign views of the revolution. Part two, Haitian cinematic perspective. Part three, video games on slavery and the Haitian revolution. Throughout the book, Dr. Sippenwall thinks through what it means to be an historian and what it means to use particular type of archives or material elements to build a case. Indeed, in addition to literature and fictional films, Sepinwall also uses video games and some documentaries as sources. In chapter four, a discussion about the film projects that failed to obtain funding is very enlightening in understanding the relationship between filmic creation, representation of blackness and capitalism and money. One of the main points she makes for me is the impact of the white savior complex. If there's no white hero in a film, even a movie about the Haitian revolution where people of color are the undisputed protagonist, then most of the time it would be impossible to find funding for that movie. The implications of the persistent old trope or colonial motif of a benevolent white individual may be varied, but they are always stifling for black narratives. 
So it is very important for Dr. Sippenwald to uncover Haitians' own views and perspective about their own history. I also particularly enjoyed chapter 10 and the discussions of French Caribbean video games such as May Willow, 1986, and Freedom Rebel in the Darkness, both collaboration between the Martinican game graphic designer Muriel Tennis and the writer Patrick Chamoiseau. I learned a lot. In fact, I had no idea that this game existed. I don't know what I've done with my lives, seriously. Simple World work remind us that if we look at different narratives, different archives and documents, we can restore the agency of individuals who have not only been victimized, but reduced to victims. So now I turn to Valérie Liocho. I met her in the normal way that academics meet or met before the pandemic changed everything at a conference. We were in the same panel and I enjoy her paper so much that at the end of the day, I asked her to submit a essay to a special issue of the journal that I was editing. Since the beginning, Dr. Liosho has been a very generous and supportive scholar. So I want to thank Valerie, not only for the power and rigor of the scholarship, but also for the way in which she mentors all the younger scholars, even when they are not a student. A letters book is a beautiful, a letters book is a beautiful um, poetic meditation and a well-researched scholarly work on water and the sea and how I quote, the past reverberates upon the future, end of quote. For that purpose, she opens a discussion with Hurricane Katrina. Discussions of the Anthropocene, our contemporary geological period and ecological disasters are woven in with thoughts about how to talk in a respectful way of lost lives in a non-mercenary fashion. In her examination of the work by artists, poets, fiction writers, and curators, she reminds us, like Malcolm Ferdinand, that a conceptualization of what Ferdinand calls a decolonial ecology must be grounded in the works of authors and artists. She also reminds us that, and I quote, in the water, the abject and the sacred sharply intersect, end of quote. Valérie at times talks about daily life and its mundane violence when you open the news, for instance, and see how particular bodies, often black bodies, are offered to viewers for consumption. That particular point is timely and timeless. In February 2020, during the height of the pandemic, one of my students, Anna Margaret, presented, on the bias, presented a presentation on the bias way that NGOs and journalists went to help Haitians to help Haitians after the 2010 earthquake. Anna Margaret explained how she found online videos of dismembered and maimed Haitians promoted by NGOs to glorify their own work. She refused to show these videos in class as she found this type of spectacle obscene and disrespectful. Anna Margaret also wondered, how do we deal with loss and the departed with respect and love? Valerie Liosho's book answers that very question. Her book also offers a new type of pèlerinage, meaning pilgrimage, via artistic creations and places when one tries to invoke and remember lost bodies and souls, not merely in a mournful fashion, but also in a celebratory and respectful way. Liosho's book also tackles how to use different type of archives to shift the usual narrative around black bodies, the colonial past, slavery, oppression, and death. Out of the powerful five chapters. Chapter three, Mama Water, the formidable car walkers after the deluge and Beyonce's Lemonade is for me a good example of Dr. Liosho's careful reflection about the distinction and fine line 
between honoring the dead while recognizing the effect of disasters, flood and tempest, and exploiting the dead caused by these disasters to make money off of them. How do we respect and how do we evoke dead bodies, particularly dead black bodies? Indeed, we need to remember that the colonial order allowed for the burial in unconsecrated grounds of enslaved individuals in unmarked graves, close to the space where they work. Hence, in a way, the dead walks among the living. The book is also about the horror and beauty of water. Dr. Yoshu explains, and I quote, Water, formidable water, may rectify the stiffness, the rigor mortis, when it is fully endowed with sacredness, beauty, and relation, end of quote. Valerie presents the sea and water as a grave, as a space where many were lost, but also as exchanges, rites of passage, and remembrance, and spaces of healing for the living. The two themes come together in the idea of a tomb or a grave as another type of archive, a space to talk about loss, but also celebration of life. Both Dr. Sipperwall and Yosho talks today not only about the necessity to revisit and go beyond what we think is an archive and pedestrian narratives around otherness, around blackness, but more importantly, they remind us again that talking about blackness and slavery is talking about the human condition. Indeed, they explore the human condition through the plight of many individuals who are often forgotten under the sea or drifting along the shores of our consciousness, almost but not quite touching us. However, no matter what they are, they are still haunting us. The easier solution might be simply to open our hearts and souls to this repressed past and welcome the forgotten. I hope you are ready as doctors Sippenwall and Yosho open doors to a forgotten or misrepresented history and remind us all that we are all connected. I give it to you. The floor is open to Dr. Alisa Sippenwall. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacqueline Couty. Uh, I'll start by saying that my heart is both full and heavy. Um, that was one of the most beautiful and powerful introductions that I've ever had. Um, it was a brilliant live review essay. Um, and when someone is writing a book, they dream of having readers who will appreciate what they're doing. So I thank you very much for that. Um, and you also mentioned I, I'm, I'm trying on the one hand to compartmentalize and focus on giving my talk, but of course this is behind it. You mentioned the death of my friend Marcel Dauphigny, which I'm still recovering from, who was my ally in France for more than 20 years in trying to preserve the memory of slavery. Um, and I was particularly useful for him and our colleagues because I, um, I was a little freer to call these things out from my position in the US. Um, and I appreciated that uh, he was able to translate some of the things I wrote into French. But I, I will try to focus here while getting back to these very important life and death issues that you also raised. Um, so thank you again to Rice Humanities, Modern Languages and Literature. I was asked to give an overview of my book and I'm going to start my PowerPoint then. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about my book, Slave Revolt on Screen, The Haitian Revolution in Film and Video Games. Uh, and I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the book's major themes, how I came to write it, and then this larger thematic that Dr. Kuti mentioned of Beyond Archives, Rethinking Cultural Production in the Black Atlantic Greater Caribbean. Um, and I hope to come back and connect to some of those bigger issues she mentioned. So how I got here first. So I uh, initially trained as a scholar of 18th century France and of Haiti. I began my career specializing in the Enlightenment and French Revolution. And I was part of the first kind of modern nucleus of scholars to take a colonial turn and start examining the revolution's colonial dimensions 
in the mid 90s. But I said modern because there have been waves in the past, including African Americans in the early 20th century, like Anna Julia Cooper, who went and studied in the Sorbonne uh, in France and wrote about Haiti. So my first book was a biography of the French revolutionary priest, Abbe Grégoire. More generally, it looked at the origins of French thinking about uh, difference in citizenship. And I also looked at Gregoire's relationship with Haitian independence leaders, which was unusual then in a book on the French Revolution. My second book, um, Haitian History, New Perspectives, started to do some of the things that Dr. Kuti mentioned of uniting talking about history and thinking about the present. So it was a response to the simplistic media coverage of the 2010 earthquake. Um, where I saw a lot of betis and horrible betis, just nonsense repeated on TV. So in watching, I realized that non-specialists needed an accessible entry point to learn about Haiti so that they did not repeat the harm that foreign intervention had done to the country as they claimed to want to help it. So that book offers an overview of Haitian history and historiography from the French colonial period to the 21st century. And I'm just gonna pop between there and here so that I can see you all a little better. Since then, I've continued to write about the differences between what actually happened in the French slavery system and the Haitian revolution on the one hand, and then amnesia or distortions about it and why these representations matter. It, that it's not just cute to study representations. For a long time, the French ignored their history of slavery and many French people don't even realize that Haiti was ever part of France. In 2000, President Jacques Chirac even claimed, Jose Adir, that Haiti, which the French had ruled for almost 300 years, had never actually been a French colony. In the US too, the Haitian Revolution was long ignored, something I've also written about. So my interest, in the erasure of the Haitian Revolution from popular memory led me to this new work, looking beyond curriculum and historiography, which were areas in which I had explored absences of Haiti in the past, to seeing how the Haitian Revolution figures or does not in popular culture. And what that means, as Dr. Kuti mentioned so powerfully, in terms of how whites see and act towards Haitians and others. Um, whether we're talking about Del Rio as the most acute example this week or other times. Now, some of you are experts in the Haitian Revolution, but some of you are not, so I will sum it up quickly. In the 18th century, Haiti was a French colony called Saint-Domingue. It was the New World's richest colony, the source of a majority of the Atlantic world's sugar and coffee. However, that prosperity came at a price. It depended on the labor of kidnapped Africans transported across the Atlantic to work on plantations. Saint-Domingue's enslavers were among the most vicious, brutal, and inhumane in the Americas. In 1791, enslaved people in the colony erupted in revolution against their oppressors. By 1794, they had won the right to freedom. And in 1804, Haitians ejected French forces from the island and declared independence after Napoleon's troops uh, ferociously, brutally, and cruelly tried to reimpose slavery. Now, often this event is discussed as having been inspired by the French Revolution, as in enslaved people heard, overheard about liberty, equality, and fraternity, and decided that they wanted it also. However, it is crucial to recognize that enslaved people had resisted their enslavement long before 1789. As Haitian professor Baina Bello has underlined, they did so since the moment they were first kidnapped in Africa. Moreover, I would add the discourse that France spread ideas of liberation to Haitians actually whitewashes French oppression and it turns perversely people who were enslavers somehow into Haitians liberators. Uh, it's also important, especially this week, to remember that around the Atlantic in the US and elsewhere, Haitian refugees were seen as dangerous. So efforts to prevent them from coming to the United States, as Ashley White and Sarah Johnson have shown us, to keep their 
quote unquote contagion out of the US and keep them from inspiring US blacks to follow their example uh, exists since at least the 1790s. So now let me come back to my book. All right, so if you are not an expert on the Haitian Revolution, but are hearing about this for the first time, that begs the question, of course, why is there less awareness of the Haitian Revolution than of other famous revolutions at the time? In Michel Rolf Trouillot's words, why has the revolution been silenced? So indeed, the Haitian Revolution was one of the most important events in modern world history. I don't have time to go into detail about the impact that it had in causing fear among whites and in inspiring people of African descent uh, on all sides of the Atlantic. But as part of thinking about why the Haitian Revolution is relatively obscure and why so little respect is often shown to Haitians, uh, I realized that its absence on screen was one reason. As scholars of film and history have noted, the general public often learns history more from Hollywood than from historiography. So my book is the first on films on the Haitian Revolution, as well as one of the first books by a historian about video games at all. So I ask a series of questions as I examine the world of cinema, as well as that of video games. And I thank you again. Dr. Kuti went into some extra detail that I wasn't able to do. So that's terrific. So first, why hasn't Hollywood made a true epic about the Haitian Revolution when there are scores of films on other revolutions? So what is it about this story of Blacks fighting back to win their freedom against colonial oppression rather than waiting peacefully that has seen radioactive to Hollywood funders? And Dr. Kuti mentioned this issue of the white hero that I talk a lot about. Um, second, though many people think there has never been a film about the Haitian Revolution, I did find uh, a number that did exist, especially from European directors. I also found a forgotten Hollywood film um, about the Haitian Revolution from 1952, Lydia Bailey, as well as other US and European documentaries and shorts. And for these films, I ask, how well did foreign directors portray the Haitian Revolution? I argue that even when they are well-intentioned, foreign filmmakers often distort the revolution's history by resorting to stereotypes about Haitians and people of African descent and portraying them according to disparaging tropes. All right, so I'll be back again for a moment. Um, so let me step away from listing the book's arguments to consider this larger issue that Dr. Kuti has raised beyond archives. If I had to depend only on conventional archives, my book would have ended there with this handful of US and European films on the Haitian Revolution. I could have obtained DVDs of films like the French Toussaint Louverture miniseries, um, and Gilo Pontecorvo's film Burn, because the studios that made them are large and wealthy and have released them on DVD and many universities own them. Uh, as a dogged archival researcher, I could also have learned about the debates behind the making of Lydia Bailey, uh, as I was able to do in sturdy and beautifully lit archives around the US of people involved in making of the movie. Um, because film archives at wealthy universities and other institutions do preserve the papers of US screenwriters and directors. So even if other scholars had not thought to mine them before me for these films, these archives awaited me thanks to the archivists who had accepted, organized, cataloged, and preserved them. Once I had the idea to look for them at the Oscars Library at USC and at Boston University. So I could have analyzed foreign cinematic representations of the Haitian Revolution, noted their weaknesses, and looked at the making of some of these films, and that would have been my book. I could also have written the chapter that Dr. Kuti alluded to about unfunded film projects, thanks to the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York, which preserves the papers of Black filmmakers and intellectuals. This would still have been an important contribution as the first book on Haitian Revolution cinema and as a critique of Western representations. However, what Michel Rolf Trouillot has taught us about silences in the archives is absolutely true for a topic like film. Whose work gets preserved? Who gets interviewed about their films in major publications? 
In my book, I argue that the economic legacies of slavery and colonialism still shape what we get to see on screen. So the very wealth generated by colonialism and slavery and persistent post-colonial inequalities to this day mean that white executives from the former enslaving and colonizing countries largely get to decide what gets greenlit and what world audiences see on their screens about slavery and other things. So that is a key argument of my book. But it's also true, again, that this inequality is reenacted in archives. So the countries that benefited from slavery and colonialism have more money for archival preservation, which is often focused on cultural productions from their own countries rather than the global South. All right, so I will resume. So thus, as I wondered, are there films by Haitians on their own revolution? I had to search, mostly not in archives though. North American university libraries have not preserved these films. And for many reasons, the Haitian state is not wealthy enough to have its own network of Archive Nationale or Departemental, like in France, let alone an Inatech or local media tech. Moreover, unlike for directors from wealthy countries for whom there were many published interviews, there were not published interviews for many of the Haitian films I found. So to learn about Haitian films and their directors, I had to constitute my own archive. This involved, um, I was already there, let's see. I have to go forward now, okay. Um, to find these Haitian films, I had to constitute my own archive. So this involved trying to find Haitian directors and our actors using social media or connections to try first even to obtain their films and then to interview them. So by going beyond formal archives and constituting my own, I was able to find these films by Haitians, even if they're less well-known and much lower budget than French or North American films. And I was able to ask, what does it look like on screen when Haitians get to narrate the story of their own revolution and celebrate their ancestors? So again, looking before formal archives gave me a richer story in which Haitian creators were not omitted. And I could look beyond more demeaning representations to see Haitians represent themselves in their full humanity. And finally, I looked beyond archives to another site of cultural production on the Black Atlantic and Greater Caribbean video games. I discovered that there have been several video games on slave revolt in colonial Haiti. I note that depictions of slave revolt in games like Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry have reached millions more viewers than any other Haitian revolution related films. But these games and others on slavery have been almost entirely ignored by historians. So I ask first, how, why did this come to be a thing? Uh, why have video game companies been willing to fund games on slavery vault in Haiti when film producers won't? And how good is the history of the games and what criteria should historians use to define this? Here also, I had to look beyond conventional archives, whether by buying games or using online gamer generated content because most university libraries do not preserve video games as they do other forms of cultural production. So I'll say, Dr. Kuti, do not feel bad about that. You were not alone here. Um, so gamer generated content led me beyond recent games by these wealthy North American companies to earlier games by Caribbean intellectuals. And here Dr. Kuti has already given away one of my favorite secrets of the book for people who study the French Caribbean, but that's okay because it is, I'm glad to see that it was exciting for her as I hoped it would be for people when they got to chapter 10. So for instance, Patrick Chamoiseau, one of the Caribbean's most famous uh, novelists, someone on whom many scholars, including our own Dr. Kuti and Dr. Loachot have written, um, in, in her book, um, Dr. Kuti writes in Dangerous Creole uh, Liaison, she's pointed to his critique of written archives and how they offer a partial and biased memory of the past. But his work is also subject to selectivity bias in archives. And because his video games are not owned or cataloged by libraries, scholars didn't even realize he created them and they were not discussed in previous scholarship on him. So I brought along today some custom bonus photos of Patrick Chamoiseau in these games for Dr. Kuti and for you. Here are the title credits from Freedom. And you can see that the scenario was written by Muriel Trami, who I'll discuss 
but all of the dialogues and text are by Patrick Shamwazoo. Here he is, hidden in the game. Um, fans of Shamwazoo know right away that that's a little Easter egg. He also appears in the other game. And here he appears as uh, an enslaved um, person in the field who is just too fearful of engaging in revolution. He put himself in the game in that way. And then finally, and I don't want to read this aloud now. Let me wait, maybe do it in the Q&A. But I think this is a really beautiful text by him that is here at the beginning of the game. All right. So meanwhile, because this medium of cultural production was not taken seriously, there was not scholarship in French Caribbean studies on his comrade here, the, the creator of the game, Yachiel Trami, a Martinican intellectual who was the first Black woman game developer in the world and who led her friend Chamoiseau in creating these games. She has said, at the time I made the game, which was in the late 1980s, long before the Taubira law, these stories were not known because they were hidden. Today, the official recognition of slavery as a crime against humanity since 2001 in France has changed the world. People are aware now. But at, the time when, at a time when the subject was still painful, it was my duty to remember. So I'll just include this for moments for Dr. Pouty also, that you can see Muriel Trami included real rebels against slavery and she included men and women um, fighting against slavery. So I'll just say one more thing that I just wanted to add it in about why, because otherwise it might seem disrespectful for me to be studying video games on slavery. But I think it's crucial to look at these representations and particularly to see how people of Caribbean descent have um, represented themselves. Because, uh, let, me, let me just show you my talk and then I'll come off of the camera and say this to all of you. So this just shows you the table of contents here. This um, first section on foreign views of the revolution, foreign films, unmade films, Chris Rock's top five, and then cheaper formats. Okay, let's see, is this stuck? All right, then the second part looks at Haitian cinematic perspectives and I have two chapters on that. And finally, this section here on video games. So the last thing that I wanted to say is that these representations matter. Uh, it's not just a little niche or cute topic to look at film and video games because when Haitians are dehumanized in how they're depicted in schools in sites of memory and in popular culture, when they're robbed of agency or portrayed as passive, poor, dumb, or violent. When we minimize French or US violence towards them, we end up with officials who have no problem treating Haitians in brutal ways now and doing what we saw this week in Del Rio. And I just jotted this down while I was listening to Dr. Kuti's very powerful opening, but when attacks on critical race theory or woke isma further prevent us from remembering this history, it matters. Um, it matters to people now. So I will stop there and I'll look forward to hearing from Dr. Luasho and from your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sippenhall. So I'm sure people are going to have questions. You, you can put your questions already uh, in the chat. We have a small group of people, so we'll be able at one point at the end for the Q&A, you'll be able to turn your uh, mic on, and then we could have a more kind of lively uh, discussion. If you have any thoughts or comments, the chat is there, so do not hesitate to use it. Until then, uh, please, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Yosho. So Valérie, the floor of the Zoom room is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you um, to the Department of uh, modern and classical literatures and cultures and the African and African-American studies program for hosting this event. But also um, great and particular thanks to Professor Jacqueline Couty, uh, who was too generous in her introduction. And I would just like to uh, return the compliments in that I was, I was lucky to uh, witness Jacqueline's uh, career as a scholar from early on in her career and also admiring from the very first talk that uh, where I heard her at the 19th century French conference I believe it was and since then Martinique and Georgia and so many places um, really admiring uh, her courage as a scholar her wit her uh, talent in unearthing 
uh, material that no, none of us, none of the scholars have have done with her also her um, her rigor in the archive and her sense of, of humor and and kindness that touches us all. So thank you so much. And I'm also very pleased to share this forum um, with uh, with Professor Alisa Sepinwall. And uh, and really, uh, Alisa, you're not and you're not re-energizing, but really energizing um, and vitalizing this field. Uh, really, uh, making us wonder where we were and uh, why we hadn't seen or heard about these uh, these video games and 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 such. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's it's a difficult task to uh, talk about a book that's already been published, and I've already. Um, talked about it several times, so I thought that for today I would just, um, uh, I call this presentation The Afterlives of Water Graves, and um, of course paying uh, my respect to uh, scholar and writer Saidia Hartman, who has shown powerfully how the afterlives of slavery, unfortunately, continue to uh, manifest themselves in all walks of existence, such as the carceral system, the environment, uh, et cetera, and all the examples that both uh, Alisa and Jacqueline uh, gave today. So I'll, uh, I'll first try to excerpt a few key concepts from the book and some of the methods as well, because it's a uh, it's a kind of study that study that required me to change my methods as a as a scholar. I was trained as a literary scholar, and I did not choose to work on visual arts and underwater sculpture and uh, video um, installations. They chose me, and uh, I would like to say a few words about this, and um, and then end with uh, by reading a short text. Um, from uh, Water Graves, which deals specifically with the afterlives of slavery. So I'm going to um, share my screen. All right, uh, it worked. We tried earlier. <laughs> let me see. Let me open my PowerPoint again. Okay, it should work now. Okay, here it is. So I just wanted to, you know, give you some brief uh, point de repère uh, for those uh, of you who are not familiar uh, with the book uh, by starting by the geographical and cultural span of, of the text, which uh, I define after other scholars as the greater Caribbean and uh, in which I have decided to include uh, the south, southern part of the United States, including, um, including Louisiana, Mississippi, parts of Florida. I could have talked about Texas, but unfortunately I haven't. But uh, the greater Caribbean is uh, surprisingly at the same time a zone which is marked by a great um, city to be hit increasingly by uh, hurricanes, floods, um, and that increasingly so, but also with a specific uh, relationship to the dead and dying. And here I'd like to quote um, a short section of Glissant's uh, Philosophie de la Relation, which I translate here where he makes the connection about the relationship between, um, uh, between, um, between death and also, um, also hurricanes. The cemeteries of countries and cities of creolization and generally of powerful hurricanes, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Haiti, New Orleans, Cartagena, grow in turn into glittering small towns like white beaches, whose avenues open onto fleeting illuminations rather than onto the mute space of a dull hereafter. And I'd like to just point out um, a couple of things here, the glitter, which will come back in this presentation, 
the fleeting illuminations and uh, a space that is not a dull hereafter. Because what I um, was amazed to find in conducting this research on a grim topic is that the artistic um, responses and offerings to the dead were never grim. Uh, maybe we could read this in relation to what uh, Fred Morton uh, has called terrible beauty, but uh, what, uh, one of the surprises in the book was the beauty that emerged from, uh, from this enormous um, uh, affront violence onto, um, onto humanity. So this is my geographical and cultural span. So in terms of temporality, uh, I call this slide time span or time spin. Uh, it seems to, the book seems to be built on a linear progression. All of the authors and artists that I look at all produced after uh, 2005, which is uh, the time that uh, New Orleans uh, was hit by Katrina and all the associated uh, engineering, social, economic, and racial disasters associated with it. So even though 2005 is really the point of departure that I'm um, starting with, uh, as I write here, 2005 inevitably contains an enormous temporal depth. The waters of the Gulf of Mexico, to take but one example, hold the abysmal memory and deep futurity of drownings and disasters past and present. The Middle Passage of Mafa, Cuban and Haitian refugee crises, the passage of various hurricanes, and the 2010 Deepwater Horizon. And of course, the list could continue and does continue ad um, infinitum, as we have already seen uh, with uh, Professor uh, Kutia Sepinwal's comments. And um, just uh, added an illustration by Glisson here. Uh, Glisson, you will have understood, is a major. Uh, uh, theoretical drive of, of the book. And this, uh, this is in, an, an illustration that I've um, found at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, where I realized that Lisson often drew his concepts when they were too difficult to grasp. So this is rhizome going in one and one direction and the other, but uh, it's just an illustration on how temporality uh, is is nothing but but linear um, and includes repetitions and uh, spins and 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 time really out of control of um, humanity. So go to the next slide. Um, the main concept of uh, of the book is the unritual, and unritual is a term that I coin. Uh, and ritual is being cut from um, ritual. And I write, and ritual is the privation of ritual. And ritual is a state more absolute even than desecration or defilement, since the latter imply the existence of a previous sacred state or object, a temple, a grave, a ceremonial. And ritual, the steering concept of water graves, is the obstruction of the sacred in the first place. So I don't stop at observing this state, this really enormous state of end ritual, but where my book begins is really how artists uh, from different uh, areas of the greater Caribbean, uh, here I'm even talking about an Atlanta artist, uh, Radcliffe Bailey, um, whose work, uh, an installation of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, represents uh, the head of a black man um, drowning in uh, a collection of, of piano keys. And uh, his head is, is covered, um, covered in glitter. And, uh, and glitter is just a small sign of how this work of art, like many of the installations, uh, videos, uh, paintings, photographs, and poems that I examine are connected to the sacred because in um, Afro, the African diasporic religions, gl glitter often signifies a communication with the dead or with, uh, with the sacred. So this is just one example of these works. Uh, what, again, as I said in the, at the very beginning of this presentation is that I was going into this project looking, beginning with poetry, um, Patricia Smith and, and others who have written about Hurricane Katrina, 
but um, I just realized that it was really impossible to make, uh, to set apart poetry from other arts and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and the um, archive that I'm using is, is highly, um, uh, highly mixed media, not only mixed media in the relationship to some of the sculptures and poets that I look at, but within every manifestation of this art, there's a mixed media relation uh, between, uh, for instance, in the middle piece here, again, by, um, by, uh, by art, uh, Atlanta-based artist uh, Radcliffe Bailey, uh, notes from Elmina, there's um, a juxtaposition of this power uh, figure, uh, sculpture power figure here with some gouache uh, drawings of currents and veg vegetation, which are just juxtaposed onto uh, music scores by Chopin. So here you can see, uh, you know, the, the relaying of arts that happen uh, in those texts. Uh, often the uh, materiality of the works themselves are, uh, super important in order to provide uh, graves or dirges or, um, uh, or other forms of, of, uh, of respectful uh, manifestations, uh, such as to the right, uh, the book uh, by Natasha Trethewey's poems, Native Guard, uh, which is um, a poem where uh, text about her murdered mother and about the, um, the soldiers of color, the native guards that uh, fought um, in the civil war without being, uh, being recognized. Uh, so Natasha Trothaway switched editors so that uh, the editor could provide, uh, provide her book with a solid, uh, solid cover so that it could also materially look more like a grave. So the materiality of books and objects is uh, really important. And uh, to the left, of course, you have uh, M. Nubese Phillips' um, first uh, poems of her long poem, Zong, in which uh, words, well, 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 water starts stuttering, but also in losing their linguistic unity Gain another unity, which is like, which is that of the of the of the rock. So Nubeze Philip in her notanda says, "I use words like rocks, like a sculpture would." So this um, this uh, you know these arts in relations are not only from one artist to another, but really uh, within most of the artists' um, creations that I look at in the text in the book and. Um, one of my arguments is that uh, using Glissant's notion of, of, uh, of relation, um, so it's a complex, complex notion, but to quote a very famous uh, kind of gloss by Glissant relation, relié, relayé, relaté, uh, linked, relayed, related. I'm especially interested in the second one, which is the relay, like in a relay race where in the face of the unritual, in the face of these enormous catastrophes, only um, a relay or solidarity between artists and arts can uh, give a response to, um, to disaster. ex is a term I borrow from uh, M. Nubese Philip, again, who uh, reflects uh, um, on um, in, in, in the notanda of her poem, uh, Zong, on the major difference between um, bodies that have gone missing and cannot be recovered in the realm of water. And she sees this as fundamentally different and as having different properties and also requesting different um, responses from the artist from uh, for instance, bodies that would have disappeared in, uh, in mass graves. Uh, so she proposes the term ex aqua from the Latin to ex, uh, remove out of the water. So uh, Philip privileges the verb ex aqua over excavate 
to capture the gesture of recuperating the spirit's name and voice of the drowned. And, and, and Philip really sees this as a work of care, but also as a sacred work. For analogous motivations, albeit with methods and tools other than the poetic imagination, archaeologists, historians, scuba divers, and museum curators bring to the surface artifacts from drowned ships. I, I'm skipping a little bit. Thus, humanities methods do not detract from science, but relay it in a reciprocal relationship. And um, at the bottom of this slide, I give you two images. And um, if I did what I do with my students, I would have asked you to guess what these, uh, what these things uh, are. They look remarkably similar. Uh, they have um, the same materiality, the same texture, the same covering of moss and, um, and sea life, the same colors. And, um, and to the left uh, is, is a, a picture from uh, the slave ship Guerrero, which was uh, recently dis re, you know, ex aqua, not ex aqua, but, but uh, discovered at the bottom of uh, Biscayne um, Bay in Florida. And to the right, you have a detail from a sculpture by uh, Martinique and artist Laurent Valère, uh, which is a, a, a monumental statue of 20 tons of uh, Mamandlo in the Baie de Saint-Pierre in, in, in Martinique. So in, in that as well, you can see uh, the history, the, the, you know, the continuation of the, what could constitute historical archive and also artistic production in the absence of, of, uh, of, of historical archive in a, in a striking visual uh, resemblance here. So another uh, aspect of, uh, of, of the art uh, that I uh, look at in, um, in Water Graves is the sacralization of the en bas de l'eau or the below water that all these artists uh, perform at the same time as their aesthetic Act and um, here I give you um, an, uh, a photograph of again a detail of uh, a creation, an installation by Edouard Duval Carrier, which is at the Fort Lauderdale Museum of Art. And uh, the installation is, which is a permanent installation, you can go visit it. It's called Indigo Room, or is water soluble? Um, really. Uh, not only performs a sacred uh, act of respect for the drowned uh, Africans and uh, Haitian refugees and, and others, but also requires the visitor to the installation to actually look up at the surface of water, which is at the top, um, at the top of, uh, of the ceiling. And I, uh, I argue that it's a little bit like limbo uh, does and that Edouard Duval Carrier is asking us to put ourselves in a position of, um, of limbo. Uh, Duval Carrier's pull for the visitor to look up at the water surface and realm of the spirits introduces a significant shift in which the living viewer is placed in the position of the departed creating a troubling interchangeability between the realms of the dead and the living. Um, and then finally, uh, as was already um, apparent, is that uh, since I sent the book to the to Virginia, I think it was, I think the final ver version was, uh, 2019, but since I sent this book out to the publisher, I, you know, it's 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 a book. It's a the unritual, unfortunately, keeps living. And since uh, in the past uh, in the past two years, I think I would have enough material for um, another book. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for this continuation of. Uh, of the unritual, uh, but here I would like to read um, a short text that is uh, an excerpt from the epilogue of the book. And uh, I have one quote and one image uh, for you that I will return to um, very soon. So, 
The cloak of water and ritual tragically reaches planetary dimensions. The drowned of the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, the Atlantic, form an underwater nation with the boat people of the Pacific, with in East Indian indentured workers forced into an exiling taboo for crossing the Kalapani or black waters of the Indian Ocean, and with many other seafarers. Rohingya Muslims from Bangladesh and Myanmar are similarly struggling in, in, the, in the Indonesian seas. Sharply in our consciousness, the lethal abyss of the Caribbean resonates with the Mediterranean. And I also, <laughs> I too end with Chamoiseau, it's just a coincidence, I, I think. But as uh, Martinican writer Patrick Chamoiseau vividly claims, the African continent at the bottom of the Atlantic meets with a stunned exactness its double in the Mediterranean. That's in Frère Migrant. The UN reported that in June 2018 alone, one out of seven humans who attempted to cross the Mediterranean lost their lives at sea, a significant increase since 2017 when the percentage, already tragic, was one out of 38. The lives lost to the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, the Western Atlantic, and the Caribbean Sea tragically resonate with those of African and Middle Eastern asylum or security seekers drowning by the thousands in the underwater cemetery of the Mediterranean and Eastern Atlantic to reach fortress Europe. Grim circuits are established between the Caribbean Sea and the Mediterranean. After his Caribbean sites, Jason de Kerr's Taylor, and uh, I, uh, Jason de Kerr's Taylor is one of the uh, main artist features in the book. Uh, he, um, he's a Scottish Guyanese artist who has uh, uh, installed uh, underwater sculptures uh, throughout uh, throughout the globe really, uh, first uh, in Mexico and in, uh, in the Caribbean, but more and more in, um, in Europe and in the Mediterranean and other parts of the Atlantic. His, his installations can now be found in London's River Thames, in Oslo, in Cannes, and here significantly in Lanzarote, a volcanic formation of the Canaries, a volcan a vo volcano that is actually now in eruption, situated 140 kilometers from the Moroccan shores. So it's really an African site, more than a European site, and 1,000 kilometers from Spain. The artist justifies the choice of Lanzarote, not only because of its status as a UNESCO biosphere reserve, but also because it is the site of the contemporary human tragedy of African migrants and refugees who have drowned in these waters. The Lanzarote installation, which you have here, is entitled Raft of Lampedusa and connects to the political gesture of French painter Jericho's 1819 Raft of Medusa, which raised consciousness about the incompetence of the ship's captain and the newly restored French monarchy deemed responsible for the wreck of the Fregat Meduse of the coast of Mauritania. Lampedusa, the Italian island situated between Sicilia and Malta, has become a tragic flagship for the unraveling refugee crisis, and specifically for the October 3rd, 2013 wreck of a fishing boat in which 366 clandestine migrants perished. The artist's ethical and sacred aesthetic utopias cohabit with the unconceivable number of victims, not merely of the ocean, but also of the walls that attempt to segregate it as they do humanity. And I'm ending with a sentence that uh, Jacqueline already quoted, so I'm not being very original here. Uh, this is also, I think, the sentence in which I, I, um, I end the book, which is, uh, a little bit outside of the bounds of scholarly work, but is really meant as a prayer or an appeal. And um, it goes, may water, formidable water, rectify this stiffness, this rigor mortis, when it is fully endowed with its sacredness, beauty, and relation. And may art continue to serve as a wake-up call 
for border enforcing obsessed leaders and nations. So the end uh, is, uh, you know, no doubt uh, a bit utopian, but um, I'd like to keep uh, a sense of, of hope and, uh, and urgency for us to think about, about these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie. So now we're going to have uh, the Q&A session, which is often the best part. Um, so while I will give you time uh, to think about your questions that you could put in the chat or you could raise your hands or, you know, I've got two people who are going to look to see if you're here. Uh, I've got two questions um, for Valerie and uh, Alisa, and, but I will each ask one question and then the second one, because <laughs> otherwise it could be a kind of a question flow. Uh, my main thing, one of uh, my friend here just made me remind, uh, realize like, oh, wow, this conversation and you know, the presentation by these two scholars really kind of timely with what's happening at the border. So I wanted to make everyone aware that I contacted both Alisa and Valerie like in March or May. Okay, I was like, oh, cool. I want to have you, let's do something. Uh, I did not know about any kind of weird hurricane coming and I did not know about what will be happening uh, at the border. So this brings me to my question, which is already in both Alisa's and Valerie's work, the afterlives of slavery uh, that, you know, Sadia Ahmad have been uh, conceptualized, uh, but other people have been going over this idea that never stops. So you have this, <laughs> you, 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 you have this past, and you know, and that's why I, I mentioned the unheimlich, uh, you know, and the uncanny and also the unholy, this re repressed past. So when you were both writing your books, a while ago, thinking, maturing, did you realize that your book will be so much needed now and will be so timely? And then I see that Sami and someone else, so at least I've got two questions for sure. Uh, so let's see, yes, so when you answer and when I will have my second question, I will go, uh, and give uh, the mic to Sami Pinar Bassi, uh, who has a question. Valerie, do you want to take this one first? Uh, sure. I mean, I was I was more in a state of panic rather than uh, than thinking that my my book would be uh, would be important. I was uh, simply in, in a state of panic because as I was writing, it wasn't stopping. It was endless. I mean, the piece about the. Mediterranean uh, was, you know, I started, uh, I used to live in Louisiana, so I was very impacted by uh, Hurricane Katrina, but I, I started thinking about this book a long time ago, really since in 2005. And as I was writing a, the, the book, uh, you know, it became um, impossible to me to write about it without, uh, uh, without addressing and also uh, acknowledging the, uh, what has been happening in the Mediterranean and Eastern, uh, Eastern Atlantic. So uh, it's, not, it's not that I was uh, conscious that the book would be helpful, but I was really uh, panicking that it, it was, I had to end at some point, but I could still be writing, uh, and others too, I hope, uh, be writing this book. So this endlessness, yeah, was very, uh, very present in, in my mind and also the, um, the concern about uh, about not being able to uh, to give more of an exhaustive uh, you know analysis in the uh, in the endlessness of, uh, of, of of this. I don't really like the word disaster, but I'll use it now. Catas I would say catastrophe. Thank you, Alisa. And so I'll jump in here. And as a historian, it would be very convenient for me if I could say that this was prompted only by 2010. That would be a great answer. And I can talk through that. But in truth, I've been working on amnesia in France on slavery for much longer. My article Atlantic Amnesia came out in 2006 and they started to do this work in the 1990s. So 
certainly after the bicentennial of the French Revolution in 1989, when there was almost no mention of slavery at all in the official commemorations, when I started graduate school then in the 90s um, and was thinking about topics, that's certainly something that struck me. But even then thinking about universalism and the silences, that was something important to me then. So um, maybe then I'll just say it started to accelerate more after the earthquake when I saw these horrifying representations and I saw the difference that it could make to depict uh, history so poorly on screen when they just said, oh, these people are poor. And so maybe we need to send troops because they don't know how to rule themselves. And that made me very angry as someone who knew the history um, of foreign occupations and colonialism in Haiti. Um, and I'll say that Raoul Peck's film, Fatal Assistance, when I saw it in 2012 um, or 2013, that energized me more because I realized these are things that people don't know and I need to talk more about this. But I'll, I'll add one other date, um, which is maybe 2016, when I just was starting to think about this. Oscar So White, that was another important date when I started to think my little niche book that will maybe interest five people about films and video games on the Haitian Revolution, maybe this is connected to these bigger stories. Um, but then back to this crisis this week, and I'll say this very quickly. Um, humanitarian crises, um, as my colleague jean Eddy Saint Paul said last week on a panel that we did, are really just manifestations of political choices. So there's a crisis because of how the US and the international community have meddled in Haiti and driven poverty and forced people to leave. So these man-made disasters, 2010, 2016 with Hurricane Matthew, 2021, they're, they're linked and they're going to be recurrent as long as our policy is terrible and we're harming people. So it seems timely, but it's, um, I don't want to say evergreen, but it's something that keeps happening. Thank you. So we're going to have two questions, but one by Sammy and one by uh, Kimberly Jones, but I will just ask my second question, then I will go to Sammy, and then I will go to, uh, to Kimberly. So my second question, which is maybe more a kind of a remark, uh, encompasses the question of representation and recognition, but at the same time, the question of how us as scholars, because as you said, yeah, I'm going to write a book. My mom may try to read the first page and maybe five people like may buy it to put in a library if the cover is nice. But suddenly we become, I wouldn't say activists, but we become thinking about uh, why do we write? It's not simply because of the beauty of literature or culture, but do we want to make a difference? And I like Valerie's uh, comment about panic. So, you know, like, oh, what's happening? So we, we need to comment about it. So, so I wanted you to quickly comment on the notion of being a scholar, but realizing that slowly but surely, despite yourself, you're becoming more than a scholar, no matter how you want uh, to define that. So. I would like Valerie and then Alisa to give uh, you know, their opinion about it. I know there's a lot of tension and you know, uh, some people do not always agree you have to be a scholar and activist, you cannot be both because then you're not rigorous enough. But so what are your opinions about that, Valerie? Yeah, so the scholar activist uh, split is um, a question that I always, uh, ask myself, is, is scholarship enough? Um, you know, some would claim that, uh, that, that, that scholars are not, uh, are not doing enough, but I think, uh, you know, I don't see myself, especially as an activist, but also as an educator. And if I make a difference uh, for some, you know, readers and, and students who will go back to, to the world sphere, uh, then it will have an impact. But I don't have the pretension. I don't personally have the pretension of seeing myself more than uh, than a scholar and uh, and a teacher. But it's it's 
undeniable that the uh, our work and my work personally, um, you know, throughout my uh, the several books that I wrote was always political, but became um, you know, I mean, my first book, Orphan Narratives, was really a text on literature. Uh, um, Toni Morrison, saint jean Pers Glissant, and, and, and Faulkner. So I, I was really, uh, you know, very much into textual analysis. And um, I was very much into the text, even though this already, uh, you know, revealed some, um, you know, the violence of uh, rape and incest and, and, and these sorts of things. But it's, it's true that I've become increasingly, um, you know, the text is still very important uh, to me, but I, uh, I think that we cannot write about these topics without a sense of, um, of duty, of, of information and transmission and a sense of ethical, uh, ethical duty. So I don't have the pretension to be outside of a scholar, but I think this scholarship is necessarily enmeshed with political and ethical uh, duties. Thank you. Alisa. All right, and I'll jump in and I'll say first, I, I don't worry about this too much, I think. And one reason is maybe because earlier in my career, I did things that were maybe less connected to the present. So I feel that I've established that I can be rigorous and objective and do scholarship that is not activist. But still, I'd say from the early zeros, and especially with Marcel Jacquigny and Yves Beynot, they were models for me of engaged intellectuals who didn't just speak to other academics, but wanted to make sure that the memory of slavery and the Haitian Revolution was remembered in France. And they organized conference and went on television. And so that was a real model for me. My professors back in the US were not like that. And I thought this is important what they're doing. And I really, I looked up to that. Um, but I'll, I'll jump ahead uh, to just two quick things. Okay, I'm writing this down. One is meeting filmmakers because be, since their work wasn't in archives, I had to form personal connections with them to get their material. And once I did that, they became my friends. You know, I was writing about their work, and so I want people to see their film. I think it matters. How do we fight against this kind of hegemony of the Global North's corporate media? We encourage people to pay money to go to film festivals to watch their works. So that is important to me. But the other thing I'll say is that coming back to Raoul Peck, um, I, I translated a speech that he gave in Berlin several years ago um, in, in a volume on Peck, and he said that he, he was at breakfast and he overheard someone at a conference and the person said that his profession was activist. And Peck said, this is ridiculous. What has capitalism done that it's divided us so that someone has this profession and that other people are not supposed to do that? And that had an impact on me. And then exterminate all the brutes, which if I have a chance, I, I have a, not a question, but I have extra material for Valérie if she's still interested in this. In exterminate all the brutes, Peck's neutrality is not an option. And I think that's important at this moment in history to be a Haitian historian and not talk about what's happening and to make a career or get publications writing about Haiti and not doing things in service of Haitians would be very strange for me. Thank you so much, Alisa. So I will, uh, I will unmute Sami, hopefully. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for two fascinating papers. Um, it's not my field at all, but I found it really interesting. So thank you. Um, so my question is for Dr. Steppenwell. Um, based on your paper, it seems like there's been a lack, a distinct lack of focus on Haiti by Western filmmakers and Western game makers. Do you think this will change in the future? And are there any upcoming productions that, on the Haitian Revolution, for example, that we, need, need, we should look out for? Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Sammy is one of my other Twitter friends who I've never met in person. <laughs> nice um, to, to meet him here. Thank you. It, it's a question that I consider in the conclusion of my book. Are things changing? Yeah. Black Panthers certainly seemed in some ways to suggest 
um, that things might be changing, that studios might realize that a film centered on black characters could have um, worldwide <laughs> box office success. Um, although there are some hesitations that I have, that film still has White Hero, the friendly CIA officer, so you have to feel bad, right? Thinking that you <laughs> you would not be okay. And it's really black on black fighting here. Um, so I'm not sure about that. And then there's the issue also of Birth of a Nation. When that trailer came out in 2016, Nate Parker's, I thought, oh my, <laughs> I can't write this article anymore. I thought it was an article I was writing because it's changed. You can tell these stories on screen. You can do this yeah. without hero and you can tell the truth about slavery except then that movie did not have box office success for complicated reasons so i do see signs of change and i think that the more that audiences advocate and say on twitter or elsewhere we want a haitian revolution movie that it will help um but because of these patterns i don't want to be a pollyanna and be too mm -hmm. naive about the possibility of change all right. Th thank you, Twitter friends, and I hope we meet at some, some point in the future. <laughs> thank you so much, Sami. So I've got two questions by a graduate student in history, um, Kimberly Jones, uh, and, 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 and I know that she really loved uh, your talk. So it's one question for Valerie and one question uh, for uh, Alisa. So I would just, because the questions are short, I would just uh, you know ask the two questions, and then we start with Valerie and then Alisa. So uh, Kimberly asked um, Valerie, so do you plan to write a separate article on the unread rule? Because this is such a big concept that it would be nice to unpack it for you know students or younger scholars who may be interesting to understand. Uh, because in fact, it's a concept that we've that some of us have encountered, but we don't have a word for it. <laughs> we, it, it. We were just, there's an absence, but the way you word it is, is really nice. So that's, that's a question for you. And um, for Alisa, a question is, uh, do you think that uh, can we, or how can we make video games accessible to the classroom to help students learn about the uh, Haitian revolution? So the question is, in fact, is about dissemination uh, of knowledge. And in your presentation, you really clearly said that, you know, how many people were reached uh, by those video games? Okay, thank you. So Valerie, go for it. So thank you for this question. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's really provocative and I hadn't thought about it because usually a concept uh, comes up in a major article. And then the book comes next. But this is a concept that was born uh, in the book. But I really like the idea of, of, uh, of just writing an, an article um, called Unritual to give it more, more visibility. Um, and maybe with some of the contemporary examples that keep uh, happening. So thank you for that. I think, um, I think it's a really good suggestion. Okay, and I'm answering about the classroom. So one thing that I do in the classroom, because it, it may be hard for someone to play the game in the classroom, they might not have the format, but there are these wonderful things that gamers do on YouTube. So again, even if there's not, even if Rice University and Cal State San Marcos are not archiving video games, gamers are creating archival content online. And one thing that they do is they create these playthrough videos where you can see how a game unfolds. So I have assigned that content for papers. I will say, for instance, analyze, oh, the other question is reception, okay. Um, the uh, uh, analyze this video game, uh, these videos here, because what happens is, and I'm having a brain freeze that's very embarrassing and I shouldn't do this on video. I can't find the word in my head, but uh, uh, um, uh, a gamer plays and then you're rewarded with this little video and then you play in as a little video and it's very embarrassing. I'm gonna remember it as soon as we get off but people string those videos together and then it becomes like a little movie. So you can actually, even if someone doesn't have a joystick and they are not able to play this, that's a very old word but I'm talking about these games also from the 1980s, you can assign them watching playthroughs. You can watch people playing on vintage consoles, Mawillo, 
or Freedom Rebels in the Darkness. And so a student could certainly uh, be given texts about history and then compare the video game portrayal to that. Cut scenes. Oh, thank you, Kimberly Jones. I'm very embarrassed that my brain was not and I was racking saying, where can I find that word? Cut scenes. Yes. So I have students watch cut scenes and then write papers analyzing the representation. And that's very, very accessible. They can all do that on their phones. So that works very easily. Now, did you want to know then about the reception of these games, Jacqueline? Yes. So Assassin's Creed Free, I focused for this talk on these games by Antiez creators, because that's what we were focusing on. But there are games by North American creators. As part of trying to make games more diverse and not only to reflect white male perspectives, there was an effort, right? Maybe they'll sell more copies to more people if they have more diverse games. So I noticed this phenomenon with the help of my students, because I'm not a gamer myself, they would tell me, oh, there's a new game. <laughs> and then I would investigate it. And then I would hear about another game. So there, there's a whole spate of games in which there are Haitian revolutionary heroes, whether it's before 1789 or later. Um, and so Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry has been played by millions of people. Red Dead Redemption, it's like a blockbuster film, several hundred millions of dollars sold in, uh, in the opening weekend. And that has a Haitian revolutionary themed episode, even though it's set in the 19th century. Um, so yes, there have been a lot played. Now, as for um, Willow and Freedom Rebels in the Darkness back in the 1980s, what we have to keep in mind is that video game culture is far more widespread now, right? This is something most teenagers and children are playing. So a game like Red Dead Redemption is everywhere. In the 1980s, video gaming was more inaccessible and it was more a niche hobby. But to the extent that people who are gaming, these, these were um, popular games. They won some awards. They were reviewed in gaming journals in Australia, magazines. Australia, Germany, France, and the United States. So they had an important impact before the technology changed and you couldn't play them on the same consoles. Thank you so much. So time is running out. Do we have one more question? I want to add one thing for Valerie, if I can. Um, I found your, fa your presentation fascinating and I don't know if you're continuing, but I have three things that I thought of. Great, wonderful. <laughs> Throw them I up. don't know if you have seen um, Arnold Antonin's Ainsi Parla la Mer, um, which is his film um, about the water and what the water means to Haitians. No, I haven't seen it. There's definitely no. discussion by scholars like Leonel about um, the, the kind of fear of the water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. So that is something. Yeah, thank you. Exterminate All the Brutes by Raoul Peck, episode two. Have you happened to see it yet? Not this one from Peck, no. Okay. Exterminate. There is, there is an animation scene of someone jumping overboard from a slave ship and then joining all of the other hmm. bones and bodies at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. Very hmm. powerful and poetic, and I just showed it. Hmm. I have had a way of thinking about this as part of corpus. Mm -hmm. Finally, in Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, which is by North American developers, mm -hmm. there is a very powerful scene of um, after um, they were trying to rescue, um, Maroons were trying to rescue people mm -hmm. from a slave ship, which is a little ridiculous because Maroons would not have come down from the mountains where they could be captured so easily. But in the game, they are and they don't succeed and it's very sad. And then you see bodies in the water and then the, the Haitian characters, the, the mm. rebels are grieving over the facts that they could not save. Mm. And I'm not gonna show that now. Well, maybe I'll do this. I'm not gonna play it, but I'm just gonna show you very quickly what it looks like. Um, uh, I don't have it set up to, let's see. Let's see. This is just afterwards, so. Yep. 
Yeah, I don't want to hunt around now looking for the right place, but this is definitely a scene in which we have Thank yeah, you. people going to water grapes and then mourning it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So it was really, so no one has any burning questions. I'm sure a lot of you are just digesting uh, everything. So do not hesitate uh, if you want uh, at one point to contact uh, our scholars nicely. Uh, <laughs> maybe to continue uh, the conversation, but also please get their books, read them, take your time, talk to your friends about it. Oh, we may have another message. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna put the discount codes in the chat if anyone. Oh, yes, yes, that's good. We, we, we all need a, disc a discount count, yes. The first one is for Slave Revolt on screen, and then the second one is for the Abbe Gregoire book, which happens just to have come out in paperback Haitian history, new perspectives. I'm proud of it, but I it it's I think it's fifty dollars right now, and okay. I don't know. so 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 we'll wait for Christmas when they they do sales. Uh, so everyone, uh, thank you very much for being with us. I know there were a lot of things, and some people got their you know the time difference wrong. Houston is central; we're different, Texas. Uh, anywho. Uh, I hope that you know you will come uh, to more book salon. Today was very nice, and you know, though we talked a lot about death, lack of representation, we also, I hope, uh, give you the, the, the sense that talking about this is also a way to open new doors to make sure that people are going to be remembered uh, properly, and you know that we see each other simply as human, and what can we do to bring our little contribution to that? So thank you so much. And Thank you, uh, Thank you, Lisa. It was a pleasure. It was my pleasure to have you. So don't worry if you know everything ends quickly. Uh, so I will keep on saying thank you, thank you. Then at one point I will end uh, everything. So if you have questions, don't hesitate also uh, to uh, contact me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.